Welcome to Important Not Important. My name is Quinn Emmett, and this is science for people who give a shit. Folks, I have spent the last two years trying to understand and focus in on what we do best here. And it's increasingly clear that that is answering the question, what can I do? 14 years ago, my beloved cousin was suddenly diagnosed with cancer, and I didn't know how to help. Someone told me about Team in Training which is the fundraising arm of the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. Now, they bring supporters together to train and run marathons and triathlons and raise money to fight blood cancers. And I realized this, running and sweating, I can do this, right? I can sweat. I can raise a ton of cash. I can donate it all to the doctors and researchers who actually know what the hell they're doing. And that's important because I can use this thing I know how to do for good. Jafar Tabebordbar was in his early 30s, living and working as an accountant in Shiraz, Iran, when he became a father. It was 1986, nearly a decade after the 1979 revolution, and Jafar's muscles were already beginning to wither. As his sons grew and watched, their father Jafar lost his balance, his ability to walk, to drive, and eventually the reliable use of his hands. There were no answers, no treatments to be found. So two questions haunted his sons. What was causing their father's suffering? Would they get it next? My guest today, 30 years later, is Dr. Sharif Tabed Borbar, Jafar's oldest son and the man closest to a cure. Dr. Tabed Borbar, welcome. Thank you. Of course. Sharif, uh, we do like to start with one important question because I, I, I like for the show to be informative and compelling and actionable, but also have a little levity uh, here and there. So, Sharif, why are you vital to the survival of the species? The work that I'm doing is going to help certain individuals who are born with genetic diseases that they had no control over live a better life. And uh, I think my work is vital to equity and to give people more equal opportunities to live their life. I think the species will survive without me, but probably the, there would be more people who live a better quality of life. I think that's pretty wonderful. Thank you for that. So, Sharif, I actually usually save this particular question for the end, but it actually, in your case, seems uh, better to just start at the beginning, considering uh, your work and your, and your family. When was the first time in your life uh, when you realized you actually had the power of change or the power to do something meaningful, to help in some way? I think there were a few people who really had a major experience in the path that I chose for my life. And uh, I would like to give shouts out to them whenever I get a chance. I think one of those people was a very good friend of mine, uh, Eric Wang, who has family members affected by a certain form of genetic muscle disease. And I saw his story. I saw that basically he devoted his life and career into studying that disease and trying to find treatments for that. And when I saw him, it was always in the back of my mind that I need to do something about this. But I didn't know where exactly to start to have the most meaningful impact. And watching Eric's story, it gave me the motivation that I want to do the same thing. I want to find the right people who's, who are going to help me, who are going to be part of this journey. And then I'm going to try as hard as I can to make this happen. So I think meeting Eric Wang was one of the highlights of my journey. So how old were you, if you could frame that for us, uh, when you encountered uh, Dr. Wang and, and had this sort of moment where you realized, yeah. oh, I could build something like this? I think I was 22 years old. But again, like since I was a like high school student, it was always in the back of my mind that I need to do something to help people who are born with genetic diseases. Because in my mind, the fact that you're born with some mutations in your DNA that you absolutely not have no control over is very unfair. Like, life is unfair in general, right? There are sure. things that you can change and there are things that you can't. But this one was a very true example of you're born with something you have no control over. And this is like completely unfair. There is got to be a way to change this. There is got to be a way to help people who are 
born this way and that was always my motivation that was always the reason that I chose my majors in school when I went to college and then grad school but uh, meeting Eric was like the defining moment that okay I can actually do something meaningful about this. I wonder at what point in your youth before meeting Eric, um, high school, whenever it might have been earlier than that, as you watched your dad suffer, when did you, I guess, realize that this was something that he didn't ask for, that there wasn't some, you know, chemical thing? He wasn't a smoker. You know, it wasn't a car accident. wasn't any of these things that you realized, oh, this is sort of the ultimate unfairness. Um, not only did he not um, do anything to to instigate it, um, but we don't know what it is or why it is. The condition that he has was a very progressive condition. So I do remember mm-hmm. when I was very young, uh, he would walk okay. You know, he limped a little bit, but uh, mm-hmm. he got around. Uh, I even remember him riding a bike. And then over time, it was declining and he couldn't. Mm-hmm ride a bike and then he couldn't like take a walk with us in the park anymore because he was very afraid that he's gonna fall and then he at some point he stopped driving because it wasn't you know it wasn't safe anymore Uh, and eventually he got wheelchair bound i think that the time that i realized there is something going on and it's related to genetics it was when i was uh, when i was a teenager maybe i was like 14 or 15 years old when you're young, it's a hard thing to wrap your head around, right? Because like you said, there there's an immense amount of injustice in this world, and we're realizing that. And, and in many ways, we've we've worked to alleviate that, but we still have a long way to go, uh, right? We've made huge strides against poverty and childhood diseases, um, but there's still so many who, who suffer from them. From what I understand, you then had to compete for a spot at the University of Tehran. Is that is that correct? Um, and right. what were the odds of actually getting in? <laughs> Uh, so yeah, the way the university interest exam in Iran works is that every single high school student in the country needs to take part in this four or five hours exam in okay. one day at one specific time. And basically you choose the major of your career based on the results from that exam. So it's, it's very high stakes. And a lot of people spend like more than a year of their life to like just study for that one exam. So I, I did spend about like a year and a half <laughs> basically not doing anything else other than studying for this one four hour exam. And it was extremely stressful. I was, I think, 17 years, 18 years old at that time. And uh, there was this one program that I was really passionate about. It was called the Biotechnology Program at uh, University of Tehran. And it had everything that I really loved about biology and genetics and genetic engineering it mm-hmm. gives you a very interdisciplinary view of different sciences prepared mm-hmm. you for getting into biomedical science but it was extremely competitive i think they they accepted about 10 students each year and a few of those students were actually from like we have also this other competition named like olympiads for mm-hmm. like different sciences and then Mm -hmm. folks who get a gold medal in the olympias they don't need to take part in this university entrance exam so a few of these spots already gets filled with people who get gold medals from olympia so it's not really (laughs) 10 it's It's, actually like five or six it's five or six yeah and out of of how many kids at least when you were growing up were taking this exam on this one day at this one specific time i I think it's it depends year to year it's different uh when I looked up the specific year that I took the exam, I think it was 1.3 million people uh, that took that exam. So it's, it's a very large uh, community mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. that compete against each other. And you actually rank, get ranked <laughs> from number one to like whatever number. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, yeah, it's pretty intense. And <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> so yeah, I, I, I ranked seventh in that exam on that year. And uh, uh, yeah, I was lucky enough to get into that program. That was that was something that they really worked hard for. And uh, yeah, fortunately, that panned out. <laughs> I mean, you say you were lucky enough to get in. <laughs> Obviously, that that set up so much of the rest of your life and where and where you are today. But you also said you worked for a year and a half doing basically nothing else on that. What do you feel like set you apart in that moment besides just hard work from, you know, one point? two nine three million yeah. other kids of the same age on the same day like what gets you there what puts you over the top 
I think it's motivation. It's actually wanting to do something really bad, like persistence, not letting failure stop you. There, there, there have been moments during that year and a half that, you know, I had bad days. I, I took a lot of practice exams and there were days that I didn't do well. But instead of, you know, you get down, you get bumped when, when you don't get the results that you expect. But then I think coming up and having the mindset that, okay, what can I learn from this failure? How can I do better mm-hmm. next time? What went wrong? that I had this bad experience. Uh, and it took a while for me to come to that a stage that it could actually take it. I could, I could, you know, not collapse when something goes wrong. Uh, mm-hmm. But over time, I learned that, you know, I would prepare myself for the worst. But then when a good outcome happens, I'm going to be really happy. I'm going to do my best. I'm going to do anything in my capacity to make sure that I do well. But then mm-hmm. there is a very good chance that it doesn't go well. And it's okay. Mm-hmm. It's fine. It, it happens. And you just got to take a step back at that point. Take a look at what happened. Learn from it. And do better next time. So I think uh, perseverance and really wanting to do something is really important. It's like you obviously work hard. You have to also try to learn from your mistakes and get better over time. I think that's maybe something that helped me. <laughs> so it... I mean, it seems like it's it's two things. You had such a specific, intimate motivation, clearly at, at home, to to set yourself up for, for success so that you could work on something related to this to go on to meet Eric to 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 build a team to work with a team. Um, but I imagine that you know were, were there practice tests along the way? Like, how did those go? Uh, did were you seeing indicators that you would be successful or or was it like oh shit I i've got to work I harder did. so that's the other thing i think the other thing that really helped me out uh was peer pressure so i went to a school that was part of a system that was called noted or national organization for development of exceptional talents and that's a system okay. that we have in iran that's also like an entrance exam for high school students, uh, I think like elementary and high school students to get into that system. And once you Mm -hmm. get in, then uh, you're surrounded by people who are competitive and intense and they want to succeed. So there was a lot of, there was a lot of peer pressure. I do remember uh, that year, uh, the class that we had was 17 people. And there were three of us who were fiercely competing with each other. There was this one guy, uh, his name was Saif Haishi. And he's now, a, I think, uh, an eye surgeon back in Iran. He, sure. <laughs> he ranked first in the whole country almost in every single practice exam that he took. Oh this guy was like Oh, wait, phenomenal. they ranked the practiced ones too? Yeah, yeah. You get, oh, you get ranked on like all these exams. It's, it's pretty <laughs> oh <my> so, so, <laughs> Very stressful. <laughs> so, <laughs> and then <laughs> I, I usually rank second. Like there were... A couple instances that it got flipped, but it was this like okay. extremely fierce <laughs> competition between me and Saeed, oh my God. <laughs> and that really helped me. That that pushed me to the sure. edge. I was like, I really want to be the first one right now. <laughs> so how can I make that happen? But uh, yeah, surrounding yourself with people who are competitive and intense can help. You know, as long as it's a sure. healthy competition. <laughs> I think right. that was also right. another. Another point, and it's, that... it can be a fine line, certainly at that age, and and when when the spots are so few, when they're like it's ten, and it's actually four to five. Um, yeah. I mean, that's that, oh my god, uh, the fact that the, the the practice tests were ranked and and shared along the way. I mean, I definitely would have been somewhere in the six digits and just been like, <laughs> well, that's it. Guess I'm <laughs> guess I'm a baker, and baking's great, but you know, uh, are we helping people? That's that's incredible. Wow. So it seems like though that. Um, you know your 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 practice and your success there and and your trials and tribulations i feel like there's there's this whole thing in the past couple of years right of of trust the science follow the science and and that's impeccable but but there's a i'm not sure if you've ever seen the movie the princess bride but there's this uh quote that says like i do not think that word means what you think it means um and it's the idea of like we have to remind people what 
science is, right? It's not this, it's not this ultimatum or, or a threshold that you cross, right? I have to imagine, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but you expect failure most of the time. I mean, you're going out to prove yourself wrong over and over and over and over. Is that, do I have that wrong? That's, that's usually how it works in preclinical studies. So when you do rodent studies or like earlier studies, when you get to the point that you get into human clinical trials, there are a lot of, the regulation is much harder, right? They don't, uh, sure. Allow I mean, you to so. obviously go into human clinical trials if you don't have the right safety margins for good reasons, obviously. Uh, sure. So when you get to the human clinical trial stage, it's the risk to a certain stage, but there is always risk involved. So yes, uh, to some extent, you have to always prepare for the worst, but be as prepared as possible. I, but I think about you know these mRNA vaccines that that yeah. are that are incredible and and everyone's like oh they're great they're really great and it's like we got to put these things in context I mean the, the the decades of work that went into them and vaccines along the way and the research yeah. it's like the the human clinical trials of of anything are you know the the metaphor the tip of the iceberg and the rest of the icebergs just just decades of of failure and and learning and processes yeah. along the along the way. So, you know, I imagine you didn't just show up on the scene after, you know, finishing in the top 10 and just be like, I've got the answer. No, <laughs> no. Takes a very um, long time. <laughs> so I tried really hard to understand the technical description of your work, and I am floating in the ether around it. So okay. I think I figured out a sort of an analogy, but I wonder if for the people, if you could describe to us in technical terms what it is that you're working on and then i will try to i don't want to say dumb it down but make it something that people like me can can try to understand at least the implications of and okay. where we are go for no, it i can definitely try so when uh, folks have a specific changes in their dna in basically the genetic material that codes for the proteins that make your body then mm -hmm there would be some specific protein that go missing or they cannot perform the function that they usually perform. So that's when they call it a mutation. There is a change in the DNA that basically results in some sort of defect in the body. And sequencing the human genome, which happened nearly two decades ago, help to understand what are the cause of each different genetic diseases, right? What are the genes that are mutated, that are changed, that cause the diseases that we see in the human population? Huntington disease, cystic fibrosis, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, Hay-Sachs disease, spinal muscular atrophy. And a lot of these diseases are actually caused by changes in one specific gene in one specific piece of DNA. Out of how many pieces? I think it's more than 30,000 genes, like protein coding genes in the, in okay. the body. And they have shown, like research in the last 25, 30 years have shown that if you compensate and restore the healthy copy of that gene, right? The, the, the version of the gene that's not mutated to the cells, to the body, you can actually inhibit the progression of the disease and in some cases even reverse the symptoms. So the earlier that you intervene is going to be better, obviously, because there is less damage to the body. So the question is now, okay, no, you know what gene is mutated, you know what gene is broken, you know that if you put it back, it's going to fix it. How do you actually do it? Like, how do you put this gene back into the body? And... Uh, to be clear, folks, he's not asking me the answer to the question. That's not how this goes. This is a rhetorical <laughs> question. No, I'm just going to try to elaborate <laughs> in a, in a non-technical Don't worry. Term. He's got it. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> and the best way that scientists have found to do this is actually to use viruses, but a specific type of viruses, viruses okay. that are not pathogenic. So... Specifically after the pandemic, whenever we hear the word virus, everybody's like, oh, like something bad is right. going to happen. But right. there are actually a lot of viruses uh, that 
we encounter on a daily basis. We get infected with what we never know because they're not associated with disease. They are, you know, they're endemic in the human population. We all have seen it at some point in our life, uh, but they're not causing disease. That's why we don't really know about them. One of those viruses is called adeno-associated viruses or AAV. Okay. And uh, it's an extremely small virus uh, that, you know, can get into the bloodstream, can get into different tissues in the body. Mainly it goes to the liver. And uh, what we usually don't know about it, because again, you don't get sick unless sure. you have like some sort of adenovirus or herpes infection. It could potentially be a very exciting tool, right? Because it has the capability to get into human tissues. Tissues, It's not causing disease. How can mm-hmm. we use this mm-hmm. for delivering these genes or for basically doing gene therapy? Mm-hmm. And the way uh, researchers have developed this tool is that they have taken out the endogenous genes for the virus. So basically whatever the virus was coding itself and replaced it with the healthy copy of the gene that they would like to deliver to the body. So basically mm-hmm. what you're doing is that you're using the shell of the virus, like what we sure. call the capsid of the virus, the surface of okay. it, as a FedEx truck to, okay. <laughs> to deliver the genes to the tissues that we want. We basically load it up with the healthy copy of the gene, inject it into blood, and then we need to give it the exact address of, okay, you need to take this gene to the muscle tissue. You need to take this gene right. to the heart. You need to take this gene to the lung. And I think the most important bottleneck during the last two decades was giving the right address to this FedEx machine. Because And now, m- I, yeah, I wonder if you can describe that a little bit because there was a hurdle for quite a while, right? Yeah. Where, where the side effects were, I mean, to put it lightly, detrimental. Exactly. Could, you, could you talk about that so, again, people can understand how difficult it's been to get to where we are? Yes, definitely. So the the viruses that are norm, normally present in nature, we call them naturally occurring viruses. So these are the ones that have evolved in nature for you know many many years, mm-hmm. and those viruses, when they enter the bloodstream in different animal models, including humans, they mainly get into the liver tissue, and part of the reason is that you know liver is responsible for removing whatever foreign that gets into your body uh, but at the same time they they have been evolved in nature to interact with liver cells or hepatocytes more and the very first generation of gene therapies just use these naturally occurring capsids actually mm-hmm. almost every gene therapy that's in clinical trials right now are using naturally occurring capsids mm-hmm. and uh, for that a specific reason most of these drugs after injection of the blood into the bloodstream almost like 90 percent of them mm-hmm. will end up into the liver and then there would be about like 10 percent that goes into like other tissues uh, but that definitely overloads the liver that would okay. introduce an extremely high dose of virus right that that's like a massive viral infection into mm-hmm. the liver and that has unfortunately resulted in uh, a few instances of serious adverse effects. There have been four deaths uh, mm. after injection of the gene therapy out of 17 patients or 18 patients that got injected, which, which has been really tragic and dramatic. Uh, and the main reason for that has been associated with liver toxicity because okay. there is a, because 90% of it ends up in the liver, then you need to inject sure. an extremely high amount. So the remaining 10% is still enough to give you therapeutic gets, efficacy. But then you when you get 90% go. of it into the liver, it right. causes liver toxicity in these kids. And uh, so the, the bottleneck, the major hurdle at this point mm-hmm. for gene therapy is not therapeutic efficacy. We know that if we get enough, enough of these drugs into the right tissue, it's gonna fix the problem. The problem is we know that how do you do it safely? How do you do right. it in a way that you're not gonna have serious adverse effects? And a lot of this is associated with the dose of the virus that you inject. Like the higher the dose of the virus, the higher the chances of toxicity. 
And there are other than liver toxicity, there are some other aspects of the immune system. Specifically, they're called complement activation. It gets it gets technical, but you you basically uh, activate the immune system in ways that could result not only in liver toxicity but also in kidney injury and other associated effects. So the main point that FDA is really concerned about at this point a lot of gene therapy companies are struggling with is how can we lower the dose? How can we make gene therapy safer? And one way to do this is obviously to give a better address to these viruses that we mm-hmm. use for delivering the genes, right? To tell mm-hmm. them, okay, you, you should not go into the liver. You should go to the tissue that we would like you to go. But how do you do that? Because that seems the, obvious. So why wouldn't we have done that before? Is that technological or just? It's mainly technological advances and also being able to do high throughput experiments, right? Mm-hmm. Because sequencing is getting cheaper and cheaper every day. And sure. the ability for us to make many, 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 to synthesize DNA fragments that we can use for our experiments at a much higher pace for cheaper, then we can actually do thousands and thousands of experiments in one experiment because we can okay. like, pull all of them together. So sure. what could have taken maybe like a couple of years to do, it could take a couple of months now. And right. uh, it also is the fact that because now we're at a stage that uh, gene therapy has a lot of promise, mm-hmm. a lot of people from different fields of science have taken interest into it. And okay. that adds a lot of value because they bring in new expertise, right? People sure. who make high throughput libraries know their interest mm-hmm. in gene therapy and they bring their own set of skill set to this. And then when you put all of these sets together, science advances much faster. Uh, I think Do you guys need podcasters? Is that <laughs> is that because I know a guy? <laughs> Yeah, that would certainly help. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. So, <laughs> interesting. Okay, so it's a combination of technological because I mean, we just I mean, we really just sequenced the genome, right? It was really not that long ago and and the cost structure for doing that has come down. The the ability to do like you said these immense uh, libraries to do multiple experiences uh, at a time and then bringing in interdisciplinary folks who can, you know, ask better questions and bring different more, uh, you know, more, both more and different perspectives than, you know, um, I mean, we see this all the time, right? Not, it's not an insult to some specific field. It's just that more varied thought tends to expand the options of, of how to move forward. Because like you said, you know it works. It's just the mechanism for getting there wasn't doing it. And you didn't know how to say, like, go to this, drop the package at this house which Amazon knows how to do in my house very well. (laughs) Um, I think about the analogy of, and please, again, correct me if I'm wrong, because that's my entire life, and I actually kind of enjoy it. Um, But I think about the analogy of, again, going back to those mRNA vaccines, um, which among the most incredible human achievements in in both their efficacy and, and the timeliness, obviously, and another thing that really only possible in sort of 2020, 2021 with how far we've come. Um, And so for many folks, they're very new and they're exotic, which is uh, part of the success and part of the issues with the understanding around them. But in reality, they've been in development for decades and we know they could work. But, um, you know, I think about uh, Dr. Uh, Catalan Carrico and, and she cracked one of those hurdles, which is making sure the body doesn't freak out with inflammation when we use them and that unlocked our ability to actually use them. Um, and so is that analogous to your contribution to the field to saying like, oh, now we know how to direct this to a specific address or am exactly. I completely off base, which is entirely possible? <laughs> no, 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 you're not. You're not off at all. Uh, yeah. So for mRNA vaccines, there have been years and years of different you know, groups working on showing how to make modified RNA, how to basically uh optimize it in a way that it's safe in delivering into the cells and into body in general. Mm-hmm. Can we use that for gene therapy? And like mm-hmm. I think through those experiences, folks actually understood that mRNAs could be really good tools for actually inducing immune response, for mm-hmm. 
producing a protein for a very short amount of time that the immune system sees it and then you can induce a massive immune response uh, i think uh, if the pandemic did not happen there was a chance that we could not unlock the potential of mrnas for generating vaccines because you know sure. you need a very large number of people to do these type of clinical trials sure. uh, but uh, but what we see right now is not that okay we suddenly come up with the idea of using mrnas to make vaccines right. it was like 20 years of work that went into it and sure. it's the exact same thing for our case like we learned so much from the work of uh, people who have studied fundamentals of av biology right what is the crystal structure of the capsid how can we modify it in a way that can we can still make virus because we are changing the surface of the capsid we are evolving these capsids in sure. a way that we want to give it new instructions. How would we be able to do this while not perturbing the basic biology of the virus, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, what we did was learning from all these basic aspects of biology and bring in new sets of technologies into it, looking at it from a different perspective that what could be the reason that previous attempts for making this happen have not been as successful how can we change and that took us a few years too right i think it took about like uh, three to four years to come up with this technology that we can actually uh, implement to specifically find those viruses or engineer those viruses to get into the muscle tissue but uh, having the knowledge from uh, the research that has been done previously was definitely essential so it's interesting, Kimi, because, <clears throat> again, um, there these two situations, um, you know, the, the work you're doing and, for instance, these, you know, the, the COVID-19 mRNA vaccines, right? Like you said, they both stand on decades of research and a lot of left turns and incredible, well-intended folks working their entire careers to make these things work. And on the one hand going, I know it works. I don't know how to get us there, right? Safely, at least. Um, you know, without hurting people. And I always think about chemotherapy and things like this, these blunt instruments we have, the best answers we have. Um, but you made a point that, you know, we we might not be where we are with these mRNA vaccines now going, holy shit, what else can these things do if the N of people who needed them wasn't every person on the planet suddenly? Yeah. yeah. But rare muscle diseases don't, haven't had that moment, thankfully, but you've still made quite the jump. And I think about, and I, I read a little bit about, at one point you were finally able, after years of going, what the hell is going on with my dad? He didn't induce this in any way knowingly. And the environment around him, again, unlike New Delhi or, or LA, how it used to be, whatever it might be, um, what's going on? And much less like, how can I treat him? But at some point on a day, you were actually finally able to sequence his genome. What happened that day? What surprised you? What scared you? And how has that contributed to where you are now? Yeah, so over the years, that has always been a question in my head, right? We know that it's a progressive muscle condition. There was mm -hmm. a lot of information out there that this could be associated with some sort of muscular dystrophy. But there was no formal diagnosis. And whenever I talked with my dad, I was like, okay, I think we need to get to the bottom of this. We need to see what exactly this is. We need we know that it's a degenerative muscle condition. We don't know what exactly it is. And his answer mainly was, Well, why would it matter if there's no cure? It's like, well, it does matter because then if there is a potential treatment, then you could potentially get enrolled in clinical trials. Sure. And I am personally in the camp of people who would like to have more than less information. Uh, the other part of it was, I think, also selfish that I wanted to see if I have it or not, or if, you know. Of course. How, if I could pause you on that note, how often are these type of diseases, even though you didn't know what it was or what was causing it, how often are they inheritable? It depends on the type of the condition, but okay. for this specific condition that my dad was eventually diagnosed with, there's a 50% chance. So 
Okay, yeah. so take us back to sequencing your <laughs> genes. Yeah, and uh, and then we yeah we did perform sequencing. We started with a small subset of genes, um, and we did not find any mutation in those genes. Like most of the genes that are involved in genetic muscle disease, and that was the point that I really understood where we stand on genetic diagnosis because a lot of folks do have. You no, know, they're in the same boat as my dad. Like they have symptoms, but they just can't figure out what it is. They sure. keep going to different doctors. That you know, there are you can sequence a whole genome now, but how can you mm-hmm. pinpoint that one specific nucleotide change that gets associated with your disease? Right? There could be multiple different like changes in different genes that may or may not have an effect on uh, the health of the human body, but pinpointing it to that specific uh disease is, is is still a challenge like a lot of people deal with that uh so we did sequence basically every single protein coding gene in his body and still did not find anything and i was like okay this does not make any sense like th- there sure. is like what is going on here so i started talking to people who uh, specifically at harvard who were more working sp- uh, on diagnosing uh genetic diseases with a focus on genetic muscle diseases. And I had a, I have a very good friend, one colleague who's an assistant professor at Yale right now. And he mentioned that, well, have you looked at repetitive areas in the genome? Like there are some parts of the genome that you have like multiple repeats of the same sequence. And with the current technologies that we sequence the genome, you can't really find out if there is something wrong with those repetitive regions. You can't distinguish. Now, sorry, is repetition usually instructive of something going wrong, or is that just something that's normal? Again, no, it's it's moron. normal. It's normally present okay, okay. in the, in okay, the human great. genome. So but he then, said, check out the repetitions. Yeah. So basically, if if there is a change in those repetitive regions, we can't really pick it up by doing sequencing because ah. like it, it gets complicated, but uh, because of the okay. way the sequencing is done. Sure. And they said, well, there are other ways that you can change these areas, but then you need to like do a specific experiments. And he introduced me to Peter Jones at the University of Nevada, uh, who actually does a lot of these type of uh, analysis for FSHD particularly. And uh, when he analyzed the DNA uh, for my father's sample, he called me up and said, yeah, it's FSH type 1. And his second question was, do you know what that means? <laughs> and I said, yes. He said, yeah, you have 50% of chance of having this disease. Do you want to get tested? And my uh, immediate answer was, yes, I want to get tested. Because you want so, more information. Uh, yeah, that, that's how it happened. I had to communicate that to my father that we finally have it answered to what your condition is. How long between... Uh, your friend, new friend, Peter, uh, who finally was able to diagnose your father and we're letting you know. And you were, when he said what the disease was, were you aware of it or was it entirely new to you? No, I, I knew what FSHD is, yeah. Uh, that was something that we thought about for sure uh, as a potential. When you have unfortunate events happening in your life, you know, there are a few ways that it can go. You can really feel bad and say that, well, life is unfair and I can't do anything about it and give up. Mm -hmm. Or you can actually think about it. Okay. This is a challenge. You know, this is, this is, this can give my life a mission. This can make me understand that. What do I want to do in my life? And if you go the second way, and if you find a specific way that you can use what you're good at, your talent and what you're passionate about and marry it with the mission of your life, then that's going to be key. Like I think all the all the very successful people that I've seen when I was in Boston or, you know, the the people who I have encountered in my network, they're people who married what they're really passionate about in life with what they're really good at. And identifying those two are key. I think finding out wh- where is your talent? What, what are you, because everybody is good at something, right? Sure. Uh, the, 
I'm, I'm terrible in music. Like I'm, I'm not good in art, but I'm a good scientist. I, I know how to solve puzzles. I know to like how to troubleshoot experiments and identifying that talent, I think is as important as what do I want to do with my life? And then if you can put them together, then that's going to be the recipe for success. Uh, I think that could help people live a happier life to basically give it a positive spin. This is what my PhD advisor, Amy Wager, always told me that there's going to be days that you would feel really down, that you have you have big, big failures for experiments that you've worked for so long. But always think about how can I put a positive spin on this? How can I actually use this to start a new challenge, to basically learn from it and leverage it to do something good and meaningful? Having that mindset is not easy, but it makes life much easier. <laughs> I love that. I mean, again, if if anything encapsulates what we're trying to do, it's that it's help people answer that question and point them in that direction. Because it, frankly, you know, our our challenges and our opportunities are are so many and so varied and often so globally consequential or intimately consequential. Um, it frankly doesn't matter what you're good at because we need all of it and every bit of it can contribute whether you're an artist or you're good at music or you're a scientist who can solve puzzles or you know me i can plug in a microphone and convince people to come talk to me for a little while <laughs> um it it does matter and and hopefully it'll it'll move the needle for for someone somewhere someone somewhere if not uh many of us especially those of us again who are who are born uh, with something that is nearly undetectable for, for three decades, um, but they didn't instigate in any way, but they deserve, uh, you know, to, to benefit from whatever science we can achieve along the way. So I, I appreciate all of your efforts and your time, certainly. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask you one last question before we uh, get you out of here. Uh, total pivot. Um, doctor, as if you had time for anything like this, but what is a uh, book you've read um, in the past year or so that's opened your mind to maybe a topic you hadn't considered before or it's actually changed your thinking in some way and we've got a whole list of recommendations we throw up on Bookshop uh, for everybody. Um, I would be fascinated to hear. I think there are a couple of books that comes to my mind. Okay. One of them is Never Split the Difference by Chris Wass. Okay. And uh, the other one is obviously Becoming by Michelle Obama. So. I mean, <laughs> undefeated. I at one point, do you know she read the audio book? So I set it up much to my wife's. I think my wife understood, but also like chagrin was I would make it so Michelle Obama was the first thing I heard in the morning and then the last thing I heard at night. And it was great. <laughs> it was a really good period for me. Um, tell yeah. me about Never Split the Difference briefly. Never Split the Difference uh, is a book that talks about how to negotiate. <laughs> and basically teaches you that everyday life is is a negotiation. It's just how to think about uh, interacting with people, like what kind of perspective you have when you talk to other individuals and how to look at it from their perspective, right? How to answer questions. If you want to ask for something, how can you ask it in a way that considers other people's takes other people's emotions into consideration and uh, basically enables you to come to agreements with people. Uh, the way, the tone that you have your conversations, have your requests, or how do you answer these questions? It was written by this was who was a FBI negotiator uh, mm. for hostages. Uh, internationally and it's basically from years of his experience that has made a big impact in how I communicate with people <laughs> sure. and how I uh, negotiate but uh, yeah, Becoming obviously uh, was also another book that that I learned everything is possible if <laughs> you do it the right way, you really want to do it, and you have a supportive structure in front of you. Like the whole story of Obama's coming from, you know, the south side of Chicago to the White House and sure. how it happened, you know, being ordinary people, not privileged individuals who work their way up, that that inspires me, obviously. 
I love it. Um, I'm going to reread Becoming. I'm going to sit down at night and read Never Split the Difference to my six-year-old. And we're going to find a way forward. And I'm very excited about that. There you go. That. So thank you. <laughs> Negotiating with terrorists. Um, uh, Sharif, I cannot thank you enough uh, for your time today and your efforts and, and all of your work. Um, I'm, I'm so excited to see it come to fruition, though I imagine there will be more uh, you know, obstacles and failures along the way. But... Um, I imagine that'll keep uh, you pushing in that direction. Um, didn't get a lot of time to talk about Michael Owen in Liverpool, which I'm <laughs> sure everybody's very upset about. Uh, but but um, I will come visit you, and we'll have a whole separate conversation about that. I'm sure Definitely. we can go on forever. <laughs> um, you know, the 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 man who plays top ten in Iran, and and the uh, the youngest player to win the to win the Golden Boot. Um, <laughs> the analogies are well. many. Uh, Sharif, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. I yeah, it was a lot of fun. Thanks so much. And definitely let me know when you come to San Diego. <laughs> Absolutely.